What's good, y'all? Your boy Ross back at again with another video. So I'm gonna check out 10 worst attended WWE pay-per-views. Now, this should be a very interesting one because WWE hasn't always had the the hot crowds and the packed stadiums and or arenas. Sometimes they were, you know, didn't have that many people at some of these events, depending on what card was being promoted, the state of WWE at the time, if people even cared for that particular pay-per-view or whatnot. And, uh, you know, it happens. It, it, it's part of the wrestling biz. Sometimes your, your company's booming and people want to come to all the shows. And sometimes, you know, you have that down point. And we're seeing it a lot recently with AEW. They are having a tough time selling tickets at these venues and the numbers are showing it you know so uh we're gonna we're gonna check out some of the moments where wwe was having a tough time selling some tickets at certain venues and certain shows should be an interesting one all right let's check this out what would a WWE live event be without a large crowd? Well, just ask anyone who was at these shows, as they were all attended by fewer than six and a half thousand people. By the way, don't expect to see any NXT shows or other network specials on this list. We are only counting proper main roster WWE pay-per-views. Oh, and also, we're not counting the two Beware of Dog <laughs> shows, because those were affected by a power outage, and we felt like it was unfair to include them. Also, there were two different shows and it got too convoluted so we chickened out and we're obviously <laughs> not including anything from the pandemic don't be a smart ass yeah i'm adam pacitti from cover wrestling sense, yeah. and these are the 10 worst attended wwe pay-per-views of all time join us Number 10, In Your House 2, The Lumberjacks, 6,482. Damn. As you will find out throughout this list, the In Your House series weren't always the best when it came to drawing crowds. Initially designed as cut price stopgaps between the big four slash five mm. shows, the first In Your House premiered on May 14th, 1995, with just 7,000 people in attendance. By the time the second show came around in July, about 500 of those people are gone. Nah, can't be asked. In Your House 2, retroactively titled The Lumberjacks, drew just 6,482 people to Nashville, Tennessee's Municipal Auditorium. In comparison, WCW held Starcade there later that same year in front of 8,200 fans. It's not like WWE were offering a Starcade level experience with their show, to be fair. Bam Bam Bigelow versus Henry Godwin. The One Two Three Kid versus The Roadie. Razor Ramon and Savio Vega versus Men on a Mission. I mean, yeah, you can see why they struggled. Yeah. 1995 is known as a very bad year for WWE mm -hmm. in terms of business, and this show can act as a microcosm of that larger issue. Fans just weren't that interested in what the company had to like offer, was, so like they the kept their the video. hands firmly in their pockets. Number nine, Taboo Tuesday, 2005, Damn. 6,000. The I remember that. The Taboo Tuesday was an interesting one. Fans had the power to vote on the outcomes of certain decisions, such as which wrestlers would be in a match, what stipulations mm -hmm. they would fight under, and what titles would be on the line. Unfortunately, considering you needed a small nuclear power station to even run the internet in 2005, <laughs> the idea was perhaps a little too advanced for the time. This edition of the show was broadcast from San Diego, California's I Pay One Center, known today as the Pachanga Arena. This was the arena that saw the unification of the WWF and WCW Championships at Vengeance Day 2001, only that show drew a much more significant mm -hmm. crowd. Only 6,000 souls turned Jeez. up to Taboo Tuesday, roughly half of the figure for Vengeance just four years earlier. Damn. Instead of a title unification tournament, these fans got to see Mankind take on Carlito, Eugene team up with Jimmy Snooker, and Batista fight Jonathan Coachman in a street fight. Who needs history being made when you got all that? Yeah, to be fair, man, the, 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 <laughs> the whole, <laughs> the match options, I can see why some would be like, yeah, I'm not going to pay money for this. <laughs> versus Carlito was pretty all right. Perhaps due to the low ticket sales, Taboo Tuesday was replaced with Cyber Sunday the following year. Mm -hmm. That sold better, presumably because it was on a day of the week people were actually free. Yeah. Number eight, Stomping Grounds 2019, 6,000. The most recent show on this list by quite some margin is the first and thus far only show to bear the Stomping Grounds name. Look I forgot at its logo. about the show. It's a little shoe. How clever. 
Replacing backlash in the calendar, Stomping Grounds just sort of came out of nowhere. It had no stipulation attached to it, no real reason to be named what it was named. It yeah. was just kind of there. Weird. Fans who showed up to the Tacoma Dome in Washington got to see Ricochet beat Samoa Joe for the US title, Kofi Kingston defend his WWE Championship against Dolph Ziggler, and Seth Rollins fight in a no-holds-barred war with Baron Corbin. Corbin. <laughs> Only 6,000 folks showed up to see their favorite superstars kick ass and take names. Their last US pay-per-view, Money in the Bank, had drawn over 15,000 fans. Ooh. Probably because Corbin wasn't in the world title match, to be fair. <laughs> <laughs> the only yeah. other show that came close to this figure in 2019 was Clash of Champions, with everything else doing 10k fans or Damn. more. Rest in peace, Stomping Grounds. You were too beautiful <laughs> for this world. It was a one and done, bro. No one, the name itself doesn't really lend to anyone even wanting to check it out. Stomping Grounds, I'm good. Save my damn money. <laughs> Number seven, in your house 12, it's time, 5,708. Despite the fact that it bore his catchphrase in the title, in your house 12, it's time, did not feature Vader at all as he was dealing with an injury. Mm. Shane had already printed out all the programs. Wow. WWE had to work around the big man's absence for their final major show of 1996, instead offering fans a main event of Bret Hart challenging for the WWE Championship against Sid. You might not think that sounds especially epic, and you would be right, but things get worse for this show when you look elsewhere on the card. It was opened by Flash Funk vs. Leaf Cassidy. Remember him? He was Al Snow before he went a bit crazy and became a bit interesting. Owen Hart and the British Bulldog defended their tag straps against fake Diesel and fake Razor Ramon, That's blur, cringe. and The Undertaker fought The Executioner, i.e. Terry Gordy in a mask, in one of the worst pay-per-view bouts of the year. It's hardly surprising that a show this disappointing only drew 5,708 people to the West Palm Beach Auditorium. They probably all hated it, but at least there was less traffic than usual to beat on the way home, eh? Number six, In Your mm -hmm. House 6, Rage in a Cage, 5,500. Another poorly attended In Your House show, another Bret Hart match in the main event. Are we sure this guy is really the best there is, was and ever will be? This time, Hart was the defending champion, putting his belt on the line against Diesel just a handful of weeks before his epic Iron Man match at WrestleMania 12. It was also a cage match, if you hadn't already figured that mm -hmm. out. Hart won because there was no way Kevin Nash was going an hour, setting up his WrestleMania bout with Shawn Michaels. Mm -hmm. HBK had won the right to face Brett earlier in the night by beating the hitman's brother, Owen. As for the other matches, well, Razor Ramon beat the 1-2-3 kid in the opening crybaby match. That is a match where the loser has to wear a diaper because there is no human. Yeah, WWE has always had the best ideas, even for that time period. It, that's that's just cringe. Humor quite like a five-year-old's humor. <sighs> Hunter Hearst Helmsley took on Duke the Dumpster Drosy <laughs> in a battle of class and sophistication over literal garbage. And Yokozuna beat the British Bulldog by DQ. Only five and a half thousand people were subjected to this total fart of a pay-per-view, and we are so, so sorry for all of them. <laughs> Number five, In Your House 3 yeah. Triple Header 5000... It seems like these In The House pay-per-views were just... Like he said, they're pretty much fillers, gaps, filler gaps, shows between major shows. So they didn't really have that much booking intrigue. You know, people cared about the major shows, but these, they were just like kind of throwaways. 146. Our triple header of In Your House shows ends with In Your House triple header. It's almost like we planned it this way. We didn't, honest. Back to 1995 <laughs> and to the third outing for this brave new format. A format that was getting consistently worse results with every new attempt. September's In Your House 3 boasted a pretty spectacular main event in an attempt to turn the sinking ship around. Diesel, the WWE champion, and Shawn Michaels, the Intercontinental champion, teamed up to take on tag team champions Yokozuna and Owen Hart. Except the British Bulldog filled in for Hart, even though Hart still got involved in the finish of the match. 
Um, yes. It's hard to explain. Just yes. watch the show, or better yet, don't. <laughs> Sadly, this meant that the rest of the card was severely lacking in star power. When Whale on Mercy is your choice to open a show, then you need to take a long, hard look at yourself. Just 5,146 people forked out to come and watch this show, which is probably 5,146 people too many. Number four, mm. Armageddon 2004, Ooh, 5,000. Wow. Jesus could have fed the audience at Armageddon 2004 with five loaves and two fish. Armageddon closed out WWE's pay-per-view year from Duluth, Georgia. WWE, if you want people to come to your shows, then please start holding them in places people have actually heard of. No offense, Duluthians. Anyway, Duluth <laughs> was treated to a whopper of a main event as JBL defended the WWE Championship against Eddie Guerrero, Booker T, and The Undertaker in a fatal four-way. Unfortunately, this was the only real highlight on yeah, the show. Yeah, I mean, that, that's definitely a good main event, for sure. But also featured tough enough finalists Daniel Puder and Mike the Miz Mizanin in a Dixie dogfight and Kurt Angle winning a match over Santa Claus. Yep, Santa Claus. Even the prospect of seeing old Saint Nick didn't draw people to this show, which only packed in 5,000 fans. WWE wouldn't return to the venue for a big show until 2019, when they put on Starcade. Remember when WWE took one of the most cherished names in WCW history and ran it as a dinky little house show? Mm -hmm. Duluth is cursed, I swear. <laughs> Number three, Ground Zero in your house, 4,963. For our final trip to In Your Houseland, we take you back to the year 1997, when business was significantly better than it was two years ago. Ground Zero In Your House, which was the 17th incarnation, in case anybody cares, was Jeez. home to a bumper main event that pitted two megastars against one another for the very first time. Shawn Michaels had been in The Undertaker's crosshairs ever since he had cost the dead man the WWE title at SummerSlam. Now the two would finally tangle in the ring, kicking off one of the greatest in-ring rivalries of all time with a no contest. The match ended with a no contest. <laughs> Good stuff. Bret Hart was once again WWE Champion, seriously, maybe he's the cursed one, and was defending against none other than Del Wilkes, aka the Patriots. This was Patriots' first and only pay-per-view title match, and Hart beat him with the sharpshooter after 20 minutes. Not even the power of Murica could attract more than 4,963 <laughs> people from the good city of Louisville, Kentucky. Number two, December to December 2006, oh, yeah. 4,800. Remember this? I said right at the start that we were only counting WWE pay-per-views, but did you really think I was going to miss out on slagging off this steaming pile of mm -hmm. bull piss? Also, WWE's version of ECW was essentially just SmackDown Lite, so you yeah. can forgive me on the technicalities. This is very After true. Launched in 2006, <laughs> the resurrected EC dub was given its first pay-per-view later in the year. And how did it go? Well, they never ran another major show again. No. Nope. Tell me how it went. December to Dismember was a disaster and is rightly remembered as one of the worst wrestling shows of all time. Mm -hmm. Bones Mahoney took on Matt Stryker. Mike Knox and Kelly Kelly teamed up to take on the stinking vampires. Davari beats Tommy Dreamer. ECW died a death all over again on mm -hmm. this night in front of 4,800 witnesses in Augusta, Georgia's James Brown Arena. Honestly, it's amazing that the crowd was even that big as there was absolutely zero reason for anybody to have wanted to see this show. Yeah. The only thing that kept it off the top spot was a real oddity of a show from two years earlier. Number one, Taboo Tuesday 2004, yeah. 3,500. That's right, both of the Taboo Tuesdays rank among the worst selling WWE pay-per-views of all time. The first one had the same premise as the second. The audience would be able to interact with the show and cast their votes to shape what they saw. There was a vote to determine who would face Chris Jericho for the Intercontinental Championship in which Jonathan Coachman legitimately came third. There was one to choose <laughs> what weapon would be legal in a match between Kane and Snitsky. Steel Chain was the winner, so naturally Snitsky won by crushing Kane's throat with a steel chair. And then there was Eugene versus Eric Bischoff, a match where the loser's fate would be decided by the audience. In a cruel twist of fate, the horror
horrible, horrible fans voted to have Bischoff's silky silver lock shaved off. You monsters. The novelty <laughs> of this event simply wasn't enough to draw numbers. Yeah. As a pitiful 3,500 people showed up to watch it all unfold. To this day, it is the worst attended proper WWE pay-per-view of all time. Maybe that's because, I don't know, people are busy on Tuesday nights? Just and that, a thought. And that too. You know, the timing of it too, I, I get because the name Taboo Tuesday, but the timing of that, it's 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 kind of hard to expect someone to go to a wrestling show. I mean, granted, we live in a different time now where people will, you know, try to go out on a Tuesday or whatnot or a Wednesday or damn near any day of the week to watch a wrestling show. But I know back then, you know, the WWE product was, you know, had more fans, but it had less fans than, you know, the Attitude Era. So, you know, to ask people to come on a Tuesday night to book some potential matches themselves essentially or the idea of them booking potential matches and it wasn't like they just had just the 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 a-list you know wrestlers the the top the cream of the crop wrestlers you know at these shows like that so it, it kind of made sense but that's crazy taboo tuesday being one of the worst attended shows for wwe but comment down below let me know if you guys have been to a live show or been to a, a wwe pay-per-view event um and the crowd attendance wasn't that good i know they tried to hide that as much as possible but let me know if you've been to a wwe show where the crowd attendance was pretty poor there was a bunch of empty seats everywhere let me know and what show was that but i appreciate all love and support bro to 150k and i'm still getting the speed of youtube wrestling champion world appreciate y'all kidding me see you on this one peace how did, how did i fuck that up see you on the next one i don't know what i just said i'm sorry y'all i'm